Uh, welcome. I'm Jake Bryant. I'm a partner at McKinsey and Company. I lead our K-12 practice uh, globally. We have a great panel today, digging into AI. I wish I could be on the photocopier panel or the overhead projector, but the conference is a little short on, on overhead projector panels. Um, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves briefly, and maybe to start you, just one word for a hope and a fear for AI, and truly one. Let's go down the line. Okay. Hey everybody, I'm Alex Catron. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the AI Education Project, or AIEDU. Um, we're, we've been around since 2019, so we're very early to this conversation, and what we do is we build free curriculum uh, designed to be facilitated in classrooms. It's project-based learning. It's aligned to core standards. Um, and increasingly, we've been focusing on teacher PD as sort of like that necessary condition that you need before or to enable all the other stuff that schools are grappling with, whether it's AI literacy or policies or tools. Um, so, you know, one word for hope is, is equitable. And that's not a surprising word, but I think it really is, it should be the word that we're focusing on. And, and fear is, uh, I'm gonna say disequitable or un unequitable. Um, Hi, I'm Erin Moat. I'm the CEO of Innovate EDU. We lead the EdSafe AI Alliance, which is an uncommon coalition of organizations that are working to promote the safe, accountable, fair and transparent, and uh, efficacious use of AI in education. My hope is representation. My fear, I'm, I'm cheating. Because I know you, I knew so you I get to cheat. I know, you knew I would, so it's fine. Um, unrealized potential. Wonderful. Hello? Am I good? Okay. Hi, Tara Carroza. I am the Director of Digital Learning and Innovation for New York City Public Schools. Um, and my hope for AI in the context of education is revolutionary. And my fear is equity. Controversial, Tara. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deirdre Kornstrom. I lead the education product and engineering team at Microsoft. We're focused on bringing um, tools and solutions to learners around the world um, to improve um, access to uh, education for success in school, work, and life. Um, I will. I will say my my fear is is the change. I think that's something we all share. Share is just what will be needed to overcome um, some of the the change that needs to happen. Um, but that's my hope as well. I think the, we come to conferences like this and we have amazing conversations and we leave feeling really energized, but also with that nagging question of what's different this time. Um, and so my real hope is that it, it will be changed this time. So Tara, maybe to start with you as kind of the, the district standard bearer on the panel, you know, imagine five years from now and, and maybe revolutionary or just uh, good, uh, if not fully revolutionary, you know, what do you hope students will know and be able to do, and how does AI help us get there? Before, uh, before jumping into what students should know and be able to do, it's that all students would have access to actually uh, being equipped with and, it, and acquiring the knowledge, skills, abilities, and access also to seeing different uh, career fields, seeing different, um, seeing different college options, and just really being able to have the agency themselves in selecting what their best path is based on what's meaningful to them, based on their identity, on their community. And so first and foremost, really at the heart of of any education system is equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And so um, for the knowledge and skills, like it's almost, impo it is impossible to know exactly what is needed, but from a universal standpoint, um, students really, I, I would love for students to not be consumers of information or content and really become producers, become design thinkers, become creators, developers. And so that they're really engaging in those core skills of critical thinking, problem solving, real world problem solving in the context of themselves and their community and the world at large. And so that's, that's really what I would hope um, comes of this catalyst of AI that we really needed, I think, post-pandemic to sort of drive us forward as a society. But I think, I love it, firstly, and I think we might have said those things 
absent AI as well. And so maybe that's you know a note unto itself. But I guess maybe Alex, what do you think? You know, what do you think's different? We've had education technologies in the past with kind of more or less impact. Kind of how does this one help us more relative to Tara's big vision? Well, I'm going to be a bit controversial in that I think it, it, these technologies are different in that they're significantly more powerful and impactful when we think about productivity and we think about knowledge work broadly. Um, so I think my, my point here is they're going to be so helpful that they're going to create a really acute need in education to really do a better job elevating project-based learning, critical thinking, communication, collaboration. Like, these are not new things. They, these, are, these are things that you would have heard of every single ASU GSV if you've, since the first one. Um, but there's still, thing, there's still areas that we're, we're, we're struggling. And so I think, for me, one of the biggest imperatives, and, and I really resonate with what Tara said insofar as, like, what is that portrait of an AI-ready graduate? And I think that portrait isn't necessarily a totally different one from the portrait that we might have been envisioning even three years ago. Um, but we do have more fidelity as to like a specific set of knowledge and skills that they're going to need in addition to those, those sort of core sort of fundamental skills. Um, and that is to, you know, responsibly and effectively use AI tools. Um, and you know, it's not going to be. It's 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 actually really hard. Like there is no Chat GPT for kids. There is no Gemini for kids. Um, and there's a reason for that. Like obviously there's an opportunity there. Um, but, but companies that are building these models are acknowledging it's actually quite hard. Um, and so I think it's exactly the right thing for schools to be methodically and iteratively experimenting and sort of building capacity alongside experimenting with the tools. I, I, I'm, I'm excited to think about that future and, and agree. Um, Deirdre, I'm curious from you, you know, if, if you have the unique purview of, you know, working and selling across thousands of districts, are districts ready for that? And and when they're not, kind of, how do you help them get started? Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if this is controversial, but I don't think anybody's ready for it. We're in an era where the AI experts are feeling out of position um, and, and just challenged to stay up to date on how quickly things are coming out. The, just I think this morning, um, Stanford released the AI index um, update, which you know I, so many of us were just pouring over that. And, and the pace of change is so fast. But what I go back to are the fundamentals, which is you, you know things that people have mentioned today, which is keeping a human-centered approach making sure that we don't let the technology um, get out ahead of the, the people in the system um, who really need to be in the driver's seat um, and leading that. Uh, certainly safety, privacy, um, making sure we have transparency and appropriate controls um, for districts to make their own decisions. And so, so we're providing um, enough information about what's possible and what's happening and what may be happening and where people should be looking so that we're... Um, empowering them as laws are made, as policy changes happen. Um, so these are not new challenges. I will say I think the pace of change is is really hard. I, one other comment I'll make is I um, my, my path into education was actually through video games. Um, I worked in Xbox for about 10 years, and part of that was bringing Minecraft into mainstream education. So taking what was initially a grassroots effort by a group of educators who thought, oh my gosh, this video game is actually an amazing learning environment. Um, and some of my learnings from that was it's the, the behavior change that is sometimes the hardest. The technology we can understand, um, there's you know incredible pedagogy associated with it, but just changing behaviors and being willing to bring a video game into your classroom when every single one of those faces looking back at you maybe knows more about it than you do. And so overcoming that fear and what we found there, and this I, I think will apply in AI, it, it was, I had expected the early and career educators would be the ones to adopt it more quickly. They are sort of closer to that video game generation. Some of them had likely played video games or still played video games. And what we found is actually different. It was the later in career educators, the people who are more confident in their practice and who could see much more quickly the impact and the benefit of that student engagement. And so I expect with AI, again, coming back to those, those fundamentals around safe trust, keeping the, the, the humans, the people, the leaders, the educators in the center, um, and really supporting them through that journey. 
Aaron Jacob, can I jump in quick? Please. Just New York City has an awesome battle of the boroughs with Minecraft. So I just, I have to share that. We did not prepare this, but I was so proud of it and so proud of the kids in New York City. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, Google it. Uh, it's, it's just awesome. So Or bing it. Maybe bing it. Or bing it. No. Bing it. No, we're agnostic in New York City. <laughs> we are, we're all inclusive here, so. <laughs> well, I, I love the, the Minecraft analogy and the, it gets to this kind of question of teacher readiness underneath district readiness, um, which let's go to next. But maybe before that, Aaron, I'm curious, you know, here's this bold future, um, realizable at a pace that it might not have been before. The technology is just so much more powerful than before. Um, you know, I agree, most districts aren't starting ready for this. I'm, I'm not quite ready for it individually. You know, how do you help districts think about getting ready or, you know, dipping their toe in and kind of what are the conditions that you'd look for um, to be in place, say, in one year that a district's kind of ready to get the full potential of this? Yeah, so I think we all can actually do something that is relatively easy today, which is build knowledge, not fear of this technology and begin to help folks fundamentally understand what is AI, where is it already in our lives, where is, what, what is wrong with it right now, and name that. Like, when we start to type something into Bing or Google search, and, you know, we put in doctor, and all the pictures are a white man in a lab coat, like, there's something there. We got to talk about the bias that already exists in the system. So are you willing to have that conversation? So one thing that I always look at when I work with policymakers or with districts or with states or with governments um, is, are you willing to say something you've done wrong in the past? Because this is a rival technology. I want everyone to understand that. We, it's a foundational technology. So we don't say to our kids anymore. We used to. Sister La Salette was my internet teacher. But we don't have any more Sister La Salettes, right? Technology is in all of our classrooms. It's in all of our lives. It's ubiquitous. And that took longer than this is going to take. This is moving faster and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and debate, you know, when will AGI arrive or anything like that. But the speed at which this technology is moving and the infrastructure behind it, like quantum computing, is nothing I have experienced in technology ever before. And so it's not about readiness. It's about curiosity. It's about are you willing to take some risks? Are you willing to do the thing you actually already know how to do, which is educate? I will never forget a student from Midwood in New York City. And we, uh, so brave of New York City to put students at the center of this work and to not just have them be at the center, but to listen to their voices. And this student, Jada, sat across the table from me and she said, listen, miss, you know, when they say miss, y'all, you got to sit up because they're about to deliver some hard news. She said, listen, miss, you got to teach my dad that when I go on the Internet, I am not cheating. And so actually what our young people are asking for, what our families are asking for and what our communities are asking for is for us to do our job, which is to educate, which is to build knowledge, not fear and to engage them in the conversation. I'd love to hear, I, I, I love it, and I'm curious, you know, as you think of that, and as you talk to teachers and to students, where's their, the most energy? Like, what, what would be the most productive, impactful use cases, you could call them, or, or applications? And you all have been deep in engaging uh, students and, and teachers and administrators, but you know, what's percolated to the top, both, you know, we'd love to have this, this would change our teaching or learning, or both, um, and maybe also, you know, what's, what's kind of beyond our imagination, but sort of percolating on the horizon? Yeah, so I think 
the thing that is really exciting for me about AI, and I also want us to think about use cases a little bit, like there are some green use cases right now, there are some yellow use cases where we need to be cautious, and there are some red use cases. So we should not be putting personally identifiable information, IEPs, student data, anything like that into a large language model. Don't do it. Kids under the age of 13 should not be using these tools right now. It is against the acceptable use policy of every major large language model. So, and there are places in this country, unfortunately, that we have made some mistakes. And one of those mistakes is putting educators square in the firing line with a private right of action on data privacy and data security. There are states where a parent can go up to Moses and sue you, Moses, because that parent believes you put their student's data into a system. They're not suing the school, they're suing Moses. And so we gotta protect our educators, we gotta educate them. And I think the things, when I think about the green use case to get to your question, for me, it's about making the invisible visible. So how many of you went to college or to community college or to a post-secondary pathway? Raise your hand. Go blue for me. So I have to get it in one time, as you know. Um, sorry if you went to Ohio State, bad choices. Um, but, <laughs> nope, oh, over there we got a Spartan. Um, so you went to college. Somebody helped you navigate that pathway to a choice. Somebody made the path visible to you. In many of our communities, particularly our most marginalized communities, our rural communities, our communities of color, the path is invisible. They are first-generation college students. They are folks who, have no, who don't know how to put together a financial aid package. We're not going to talk about FAFSA today. We could. Another panel. Um, but it's invisible. AI could make it visible. And so the green use case I want you all to think about is how do we make the invisible visible? How do we take coded knowledge, coded language that's been in the hands of a human and democratize that expertise? AI is about democratizing expertise when the internet democratized knowledge. I'd love to share. Share. Um, I'd love to share an amazing program we have in New York City, uh, the Pathways program, Future Ready NYC, which we have like 10 to 12,000 students who do have a visible pathway forward and who are, um, who, you know, New York City, we're, we're the largest school system in the country, we have 47 districts, we have close to a million students, 1,800 schools, and the biggest diversity in the country. And so, um, when we talk about equity in education and access and, and the pursuit of economic security, we really um, are forward thinking in that as, as a city. And uh, shout out to Chancellor Banks and Jade Grieve who have really driven that for, for our city as well as um, our career and technical education programs. So Aaron was talking about Moses Ojeda, who's a principal <laughs> in New York City, but we have really amazing programs and sometimes we're so busy in New York City, we don't get to, sh to share it out. Um, however, like it's just one thing that has really made uh, an inclusive community of students have access to something they otherwise would not. And it's critical for us in, urban, in, in our community and any student, like everyone should have access. I, I mean, you know, I have kids. I try, I, when I was a teacher, I treated every student like they were my child. And we can't lose that. We can't lose that sight with any technology. It's not about a technology. It's not about a product. It's not about going to market. It's about the kids. It's about their experience, and that's what true transformation will be with these technologies enhancing the student experience. I love the kind of invisible made visible. That feels like a unmitigated good, and and because there are other kind of checks in the system, it feels lower downside risk. I don't know if I want to accept them as yellow, but what are the use cases that feel sort of call them higher risk? higher reward, and maybe, you know, to kind of core teaching and learning or assessment, like if we get this wrong, then there's some consequences, but also the upside 
might be even bigger. Maybe Alex with you. Yeah, it's like, um, this is an easy one. So uh, personalized tutors or personalized mentors. Um, and you could really imagine like the best version of this is uh, a personalized tutor or coach that starts with you, you know, in fifth grade and you're working with this coach throughout your career. It understands your passions. It's able to guide you and point you towards, um, you know, your, like, those, those specific pathways that are aligned with your interests. It knows your interests. It knows what games you're playing, what your strengths are. And it also has a data feed of like literally like a real time picture of job, the job market. Um, and it's gonna be more responsive than any teacher could ever hope to be. Um, and it will also be a sorting hat for your kids. Like when they, gra when, like, they graduate high school, colleges won't need a, an assessment or a standardized test. It will seem out of date. They'll just go to your personalized coach and say, where should this kid, w what is the best college or the best pathway for this kid? Um, and that scares me because that is literally, there's like many dystopian science fiction novels about that exact situation. and. You know, for me, I don't have an answer to that. I really struggle with it because, um, you know, even if you protect the data, like, you know, someone, there will have to be data. Uh, so are we going to be willing to trust any organization to have control over something that could literally just, like, be dictating the, the, the future of our kids? And I think this is why, in, in, a, in a situation where we don't have an answer to this, um, the, the answer is put teachers and educators at the center of the design. Um, because we don't need to go with the, like, omniscient and all available AI tutor. Like that is one direction we could go. We could also just put students in cubicles and have them put headphones on and have them interact with a really compelling AI uh, teacher. Um, and we could just use all our gymnasiums for that. But I, I think that we have agency to say, you know what, there are also like some really important fundamental skills and things that you need to build uh, in school and we wanna create those spaces um, and, this, and that will require uh, people who really have the kids' best interest and really understand their, those kids in mind. Um, I, I also just want to like two, two quick anecdotes because sometimes I think we, we are talking too much in the abstract. So uh, two quick use cases. So one teacher, instead of uh, writing student feedback uh, in, in written form on, in response to the essays, he uses ChatGPT and he tells the students, I'm using this ChatGPT to provide you with some initial feedback. Could be wrong. Let's talk about it either way. And he uses that time now to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with kids. That's, that, that is exactly the kind of thing that we want to encourage. And then the other example is a math teacher who, instead of standing in front of the chalkboard and just sort of like going through equations with half the kids like asleep on their, on their desks behind him, he uses that time to have kids break out, work with a personalized math tutor individually on a series of questions that are aligned to their aptitude. And then he breaks them out in the second half of class to, in groups to work on projects. And what he saw is, the engagement was up overall, but also the kids that were previously the least engaged actually had the biggest improvement in engagement. Um, but that was a co, th th those are both examples of teachers truly co-designing the, ap the application. Those aren't just tools that were thrown at a school. Deidre, I'd love, yeah. like, have we just described your product roadmap or <laughs> yeah, I'm like what have we missed or, or, or what are you missing? I'm gonna borrow Jake's clipboard to take some notes on this. But, but yeah, there's, there's a couple areas that come to mind. One is going a little bit veering into that higher risk, which is, um, some of that playing into, again, some of the fear of change, which is, is, is my job going to be replaced or is going to be taken over? And so the, the way that we've approached it and I think about it is what are those tasks that are lower value add or those tasks that you really don't like to do? And in, in the Minecraft world, we said, what's that lesson that you just really don't want to take, like teach every year? Is it multiplying fractions? What's at the very bottom of your list? And just go try a Minecraft activity with that one because what do you have to lose? And, and what we found is people very quickly thought, oh my gosh, this is so much better. And so some of those tasks, like, for, you know, on the topic of literacy, we know reading practice is the greatest predictor of success, not just in literacy, but in learning outcomes. And so taking some of those tasks that are time consuming, like, but providing level appropriate student, you know, aligned with student interest content for reading, that's a lot of work. And if we can use Gen AI models to create that in a way that is, you know, imagine if, you know, Moses loves soccer and <laughs> I, you're so glad you sat right here. But if, if we can, and he's, and he's a reluctant reader, but if we can create reading content that incorporates our vocabulary list and a story that's interesting to him and he can choose what happens next, suddenly we've tapped into almost that sort of game loop and we've taken that pressure off the educator to be sourcing content that he's going to reject and sort of that battle. So, so going to places where there's 
a job that needs to be done. It's not the most fun thing. It's not the most rewarding. Um, it's you know a little bit higher risk because we're veering into some new territory and having to do new training. Um, the, the other area that's you know potentially higher risk, higher reward is um, teacher professional development, um, which is something that is I think uh, universally a friction point. I, we were in New York about a year ago and um, met with a group of principals, and someone said, "There's never been a good PD session," and I was like, "Never." And he was adamant. Never. And so teacher professional development is another area that's really interesting. First, on the, surp on the subject of AI literacy, but even beyond that, how can we use these tools that are grounded in the standards and the curriculum and what we need to deliver in the, you know, whatever data that you want to bring in from your organization and use that to surface the information just in time, just when you need it. So you're not going off and spending extra time, your own time, um, in order to acquire the learning and the context that then when you come back in the situation, that's weeks or months or years ago. Um, and so thinking about how we can use this technology um, to tackle something again that's just like, seems to be universally a real friction point. I'd love to dig in. Some of these feels so promising and, and teacher professional development you know, for most districts, you know, everywhere is up. Um, so maybe in that way, not not high risk. Um, how do you think about, the, you know, when I talk to teachers about this among many concerns, a big one comes back to the AI doing the thinking for the students and that therefore kind of not developing the capacity to do it themselves. So I, I'd love, you know, we could talk about privacy, we can talk about other risks, but when I talk to teachers, that's actually one of their biggest concerns is, you know, if you're not, if you're not writing the essay, then you're not learning to write. And what would you say to those teachers and, and how do we kind of build around that concern? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, there's a couple of things I wanna say here, but you're tapping into something for me that is deeply personal because of my son, who is dyslexic and dysgraphic and nine years old. And I just finished parent-teacher conferences. Um, I'm not going to, my superintendent's here, so I'm not going to put him on blast. But, um, you know, uh, my son, Robert, is brilliant. He is a brilliant, brilliant young person. He tells me that the Louvre is his favorite place to go when we're in Paris. What? What nine-year-old says that? And the thing about it is, he cannot write. He can't. It would be like asking him to paint a Picasso. How can his brilliance be seen in this world? He needs accessibility and the supports that text-to-speech provide for him, that things like spell check provide for him to things that help him get the brilliance in his mind out so the world can appreciate it and appreciate him and appreciate his unique contribution. But this is not unique to Robert Tucker. It is the brilliance of our young people is often not seen. Whether it's a factor of the zip code they live in or whether a teacher doesn't like the way they look or they talk or they speak, and so how can we think about AI as a way to help our young people have accessibility that they have never known, to discover their brilliance, to discover their passion, to unlock the pieces of their sense of belonging that make them want to go back to school? We have a problem in this country, y'all. Kids aren't going to school right now. And then they're not only not going to school, they're not going to post-secondary pathways. I see a lot of head nodding. So let's just say the hard thing. We aren't doing our job. So how do we think about the experiences that shift the role from consumer to creator? From teacher as a sage on a stage to an enabler of a learning experience to someone who can unlock the brilliance of our young people. That is a future I am going to sign up for. I will be here for. I will fight for. And you can too. And so I believe that when we think about those, those problems of practice, they're right in front of us. It's engagement. It's 
teacher preparation. It's the mental health of our young people. All the things that you just talked about are about a young person having a meaningful connection with a caring adult. And when they have that meaningful connection with a caring adult and they're a teenager, suicidal ideation drops by a third. And that's not me, that's the Surgeon General. He's way smarter than I am and he has a spiffy uniform. And so we know what works. Let's use AI to deepen and strengthen human connection and to deepen and strengthen those skills. And I think those are fundamental literacies we can build together. Tara, I'd love, you know, in New York City, you have, there's a lot going on on this. And you know, we've talked about a lot of interesting use cases from, um, uh, from tutoring in kind of the yellow category to, to teacher PD or teacher productivity in the green. Um, I'd say which of these kind of feels like We've got this, it's happening, teachers are getting it in the system, students are excited, and which of them still feel like, mm, we're not, you know, that's an interesting idea, that might be on next year or the year after's roadmap, or actually we do have it, but we actually just can't te get teachers excited. Sort of where's the, the green and the yellow mm -hmm. now for New York City? Well, we're really still in the exploration stage of this. And so we did some pre preliminary, not completely inclusive, um, uh, surveying of our, of our educators in the system. But 60% of educators are interest, interested in having more professional learning around artificial intelligence. So we have, you know, we have great partners who are already doing this. Uh, AIEDU, Alex is one of them. We have some uh, asynchronous from Microsoft. We have Google. We also have a great program that's really been like leading this historically, which is computer science for all. Uh, more on the algorithmic thinking and um, bias and, and equity in AI perspective. And so now we're at the point where we're thinking about what does this look like from pre-K onwards? And how do we really integrate all of these new 21st century literacies across every part of the curriculum so it's not like, it's not a, an add-on, it's not an extra for teachers and educators and paraprofessionals and uh, related service providers because we all have to be cohesive in a system as large as ours and we have to all be speaking the same language and moving from the same terminologies and that's hard but it's that's our job in education it's systems and structures and um we were talking about this this morning at breakfast we have to take care of the people who take care of kids uh and and i think that's really our focus now is how do we empower adults to then empower children with this new technology yeah, but Jake, you, you asked earlier about sort of looking across districts and, and ministries around the world. One thing we've seen in New York in particular is that, that very clear focus and leadership and um, setting the agenda of we want to be a leading school organization using AI, and that's incredibly helpful. It provides that clarity in that direction. And so we've seen with, with the mayor's initiative around um, literacy and dyslexia awareness, getting every New York City public school educator trained. Um, some of the early experimentation you've done has been you know, very much philosophically aligned and directed, but driving that path forward and that innovation um, and just providing the clarity of here's where we're going and here are the steps that we're taking and here are the outcomes that we're seeing and the expectations that we have. So I think the, the early work on some of the chatbots um, has been really the exciting. AI teaching yes. assistant. Yes. Too, yeah. Can we actually so, just build on that from a kind mm -hmm. of commercial lens? So New York and maybe 10 districts are unique in that they have the scale of you know, an enterprise customer. Um, but the majority of districts are pretty small. So, you know, if a superintendent of, of a 10,000 student district, God bless them, came to you and said, I want to build my own LLM, we're going to do it in-house, like, can you help? Um, the answer would probably be no. And so, or, or like, a less ready yes. So how do you think about taking the leadership of a New York City um, and products that emerge there and making them more sort of scalable to the typical district? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So we, we definitely um, approach 
any of the investments that we're making of how can we make this very broadly available, not just in the large U.S. districts or small U.S. districts, but, but truly globally. And so, you know, with, with New York, we've enabled them with access to the technology and sort of co-created in many ways, but very much empowering them and looking at how does this scale. So we, we have, I'll say, out-of-the-box tools, things like Reading Progress and Reading Coach. Um, reading Progress is in Teams for Education that's doing reading assessment and providing practice. Um, and then we recognize that's you know limited in terms of who, who can use that. And so we recently released Reading Coach, which is available to anyone. Um, it's free, it's on the web, it's in Windows. It does require a login because we're enabling the learner to monitor their, their progress in their learning journey. So tracking how many minutes they're reading, how they're progressing, but that's free and available to anyone. And so that's taking some of the Gen AI and that's allowing the student to create their own stories to do reading practice, um, putting that in the hands of the educators. And then going through to the tools like Copilot Studio and Azure AI Studio, they truly are, that there's so much excitement and enthusiasm from anyone who's connected in technology and interested in technology. It's never been as accessible as it is today to actually create your own tools. And so there's amazing examples and showcases. There's workshops happening throughout the air show and the GSV summit on um, creating your own co-pilots, creating your own GPTs. It really is accessible. It, it also creates a situation where there is so much out there. It's very difficult to sort through, but for a motivated small district, um, they, they can create their own tools. And there's an amazing assortment of things that are ready out of the box today that get them on board. I think the, the number one thing is the, the sort of AI literacy and access to the training. Again, there's, there's some great training from Microsoft. We have training um, AI literacy on the Microsoft Learn platform. <clears throat> Excuse me, Microsoft Learn platform, but there's so much. I think so having that clarity of we're going in this direction and let's start with getting that baseline education. Let's look at some of those sort of green zone tools that are available today. Alex, I'd love to hear how you all think about that less from the kind of product angle and more from that PD kind of change readiness support. How do you take the, the leadership of a district with some resources and way to throw around and, and make this something that you know, your typical district could tackle more readily? Yeah, I mean, the, the answer to almost everything is AI literacy. You can't, you can't have policies and guidelines that work if your teachers don't understand the technology. You can't implement any tools effectively if the teachers, if it's actually teacher-centric, the teachers also need to understand not just how to use the tool. This isn't ed tech tool training. This is understanding AI. Um, but the biggest thing is you cannot solve this, like the cheating problem or academic integrity, and you're going to have to solve it because they are going to be transformational. There's not a small percentage of students in our schools that are dyslexic, just to, to name one uh, neurodivergent um, group. Um, so we're going to use these tools, and these kids are going to have access to these tools after school anyways. Um, the only way to design assignments that are uh, not going to be, and I, I think if a student goes home and just uses a chat GBT to write an essay and doesn't think critically at all, uses a, you can use a one-sentence prompt and get a full essay, I do not think that should be okay. Like, that is going to undermine that student's metacognitive skills development. Um, so how do you do that? Well, teachers need to design assessments that are resistant to that kind of work. They need to be pushing students to actually show their work, under, like you're going to be graded not on the output, but on the process. And, and the only way teachers are going to be able to design those assessments um, and think through, like, what does this look like is if they themselves understand, like, what is AI and how does it work? And if they understand that, they're going to be really effective at implementing the changes in the classroom, they're also going to be allies in all of the really important work that has to be done to make sure that these tools are safe, that we're like, being really thoughtful and methodical about how they're rolled out. Yeah. Um, but AI literacy is like that, and, and I think it's the first step, and so you know, I'm gonna call out Hudson City Schools where my English teacher is now the superintendent, and they were one of the first schools in the country to do AIPD before ChatGPT. Um, so this is not just a big school paradigm, this is something that any school district can get started with. They may not necessarily build their own model, though. That I mean, <laughs> one thing though I really appreciate about, about like our partnership with AIEDU is that Alex and the team have been willing to differentiate levels of what we need and personalize it towards us. So I would just like that is just something we value in New York City is understanding the taking the time to understand our context to have people who are from our community on their team and understand and be willing to really adapt to what we need. And so I would just encourage that as a 
as a best practice for any partners in the room for professional learning or even developers that the context of the community you're serving is, is non-negotiable. Absolutely. And maybe Tara, to just give you the chance to close this, you know, I imagine we'll be here next year. We'll probably talk about AI again. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. What, what do you hope? You know, a few words. What What do you hope will be will be different and will be kind of counting as wins uh, in one year's time? So, for I'm going to break it up for developers. I hope that accessibility and language are integrated into every platform as something that's not an afterthought, that's something that's the first step. Um, and then for New York City, I just hope we keep innovating and growing. I mean, I think, you know, I'm biased, but I think we're the best school district in the, in the country. So I just hope we can really capture the energy of New York City and the um, amazing work that's already going on. There's other principals here, Principal Lou, Andy, like we have, Amazing work happening in New York City, so I hope from a central level uh, with systems and structures, we can really empower the entire system and all of our students. Great, well, uh, we're at time. If you'll join me in thanking our panelists.